three, check one, two, three. Is a sound check for DMA? Check one, two, three, check one, two, three. Thank you very much. Three, check one, two, three. Is a sound check for DMA? Check one, two, three, check one, two, three. Thank you very much. Good morning. Uh, good to see everybody, and uh, thanks for joining us uh, on this great Saturday. I'll give you a quick operational update, and uh, as well as answer your questions, and uh, obviously Mr. Kirby's here also, so we look forward uh, to that. Uh, before I describe uh, the situation in Kabul uh, for the past uh, 24 hours, uh, I want to do a little bit, uh, take the ability to recap the past week and kind of present a, a holistic view uh, of what's been accomplished. As you know, August 14th, uh, we began uh, this evacuation operation, which really is exactly uh, one week ago uh, today. Since then, uh, we have rapidly deployed thousands of troops into Afghanistan. Our footprint continues today to stand at approximately 5,800 troops on the ground, continuing to provide and secure the Kabul airport to allow for evacuation operations. As you know, these troops were both pre-positioned in the CENTCOM AOR, as well as deployed from the United States. Then, as uh, forces steadily flowed in, we successfully secured uh, the Kabul airport. If you recall, uh, the situation just uh, a week ago uh, was a little bit different th than it is today. The airport remains secure. Uh, U.S. military personnel currently oversee flight operations. Both U.S. military contracted aircraft as well as foreign aircraft continue to operate within Kabul airport. Additionally, the U.S. military has maintained the gate security at major gates and supported our State Department colleagues uh, in the processing of individuals in Dehkaya to prepare for evacuation flights out of Afghanistan. Critical to getting Americans, SIV applicants, and Afghans at risk out of the dire situation in Afghanistan requires uh, additional space at intermediate staging bases and safe havens in other locations. This impacts our throughput as I discussed yesterday. For example, uh, two days ago, if you recall, uh, the U.S. military airlifted nearly 6,000 uh, evacuees in a single day. In the last 24 hours, uh, six U.S. military C-17s and 32 charters departed Kabul. Through this combined effort, the total passenger count uh, for those flights was approximately 3,800. Also in the past 24 hours, a number of C-17s are moving between Qatar and Germany providing critical relief uh, that will increase our input to those intermediate staging bases. And finally, in the past uh, 24 hours, three flights landed at Dulles International Airport. There are now Afghans in just one week since beginning this operation have left Afghanistan and will be transitioned to Fort Bliss today for further processing in this process. As you can see, this is a very complex and multi-step operation. We are committed uh, to this highly important mission to bring American citizens, SIV applicants, and at-risk Afghans who have worked alongside of us throughout our time in Afghanistan and vulnerable Afghans, including women and children, safely out of Afghanistan. Since the end of July, we have relocated approximately 22,000 people. Since the beginning of uh, this evacuation operation on August 14th, we've evacuated approximately 17,000. I would add that intelligence, law enforcement, and counterterrorism professionals are conducting screening and security vetting for all SIV and others, uh, vulnerable Afghans, before they are allowed to enter into the United States. These agencies are surging resources to evaluate all of these evacuees to ensure uh, protection of the homeland. This massive effort is the result of teamwork across the interagency and the cooperation of our partners around the world who share in this incredible effort. Thank you. Okay. Looks like uh, Lita, you're on the phone. Hi, uh, yes, thanks, John. Um, for either you or the general, um, obviously there's fewer people getting out 
um, of Afghanistan over the last 24 hours, and the embassy has issued uh, a warning telling people not to go to the airport. Can you talk about the security outside the perimeter? Is it getting worse? And what are the key threats there? Is it Afghans trying to get in? Is it ISIS? Is it the Taliban? Can you just uh, give us a clearer picture of the violence going on out, uh, outside the airport? Yeah, the first part of the question is, uh, I think uh, you talked about guidance going out to not come to HK. I'm not uh, familiar with that directly. We are continuing to process uh, people throughout the, uh, the last 24 hours. Uh, the commanders are, are metering how many people come in and out of the gate uh, to ensure uh, the safe and ability to screen uh, applicants uh, as they come onto HKIA. Um, th there has been no reported uh, change uh, to the current enemy situation in and around uh, the airport at this time. Yeah, Court. Can I follow on that? The, this, I'll just read you this part of it. It was a security alert that came out of the embassy this morning. It says, because of potential security threats outside the gates at Kabul Airport, we're advising U.S. citizens to avoid traveling to the airport and avoid airport gates at this time unless you receive a specific call to come there. So can you explain what is this threat? Is it, is it Taliban? Is, it, is there an ISIS or an al-Qaeda angle to this? Yeah, look, I, I think uh, you can understand, uh, Courtney, why we're not going to get into uh, specific details uh, about the threat environment or what um, or, or what our intelligence uh, is given us. We have said from the very beginning of this um, uh, that we're going to try to do this in a safe and orderly way, and that means making sure that nobody gets hurt. Uh, to the maximum extent possible. So what you're seeing out of our State Department colleagues, I think, is uh, you know, a prudent notification to make sure that, uh, that whatever movement there is to the gates from outside the airport is done uh, as safely as possible and that uh, people have uh, the information they need to make the best decisions for themselves going forward. So uh, I, I do understand the, the question and the interest, but I, I hope you understand that we're going to be very careful about uh, what kind of uh, what kind of extra context we're going to put out there in the information environment. There was a, there was a, a, a crowd threat that that led to the evacuation via helicopter on Thursday of some Americans from right near the airport. So I guess what we're trying to figure out is sure. is this just a there's large crowds and it's difficult for Americans to get there and that or is there actually a threat against the airport? Again, I'm not going to get into specific threat assessments. Um, the situation in Kabul uh, the, and the whole city is fluid and dynamic. Um, and you have seen uh, the images over the last 24 to 48 hours uh, yourself of uh, the situation outside the perimeter of the airport. And it changes. It changes almost by the hour and it changes in locations around the airport. It's very, very fluid and dynamic. And so um, and I don't want to speak for the State Department, obviously, but, but, but like our military commanders, they are going to make decisions in real time about what's in the best interest of, of uh, innocent civilians uh, that, that have need to get to the airport and we want to get inside uh, the security gates. We're just going to th – this will change, uh, you know, every, every day. There will be, there'll be modifications to our assessments of the security environment and – uh, and what we think is in the best interest of, Can I ask of people. You one other that's not related to this is there's some reports that the of Afghan military and maybe some others who are who are rising up against the, the Taliban, particularly some in the north. And I'm wondering if there's been any request for U.S. military airstrikes to support them. And if so, is that the kind of thing that the U.S. military would engage in? I don't want to anticipate or talk about the future. As you know, um, no uh, current requests for that have come in. Uh, but uh, we continue to maintain the current capability that we've had uh, on the ground and in the air uh, since we began operations. And the only thing I'd add, Court, is uh, the, the mission hasn't changed. The, the mission of the United States military in Kabul is to secure that airport, keep it secure, um, uh, conduct, manage, and lead air operations so that we can continue to move people out. That's the focus of the military mission. But, but a week ago, there was a mission to support the A and it's still to sort of support the Af Afghan military with airstrikes. So, I mean, and, and that was supposed to continue until August 31st. So it stands to reason, I know that the situation has changed a lot in the last week, but it stands to reason that the U.S. military would still have the authority, if not the 
uh, the, 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 to the, carry out strikes if, if requested by the Afghan military. But I guess at this point they have not been requested, is what we're told, right? Uh, well, the general said there's been no request. I just want to stress that the military mission that we are executing now is a non-combatant evacuation operation. That is what we're focused on. Thanks, Tara. In the last 24 hours, two uh, Taliban leadership have named the Haqqanis in charge of securing uh, the streets of Kabul and the city of Kabul. Um, has that been part of the changing situation on the ground and making it less uh, safe for Americans to try and travel to the airport? Again, I'm not going to detail the threat assessments uh, and what the intelligence is saying in there. It is very fluid and very dynamic. What I would tell you is that we continue to have uh, regular communication uh, with Taliban leaders there in Kabul, particularly those that are manning or in charge of the checkpoints around the airport, that communication and deconfliction occurs. That, that has not changed. Is the concern that while there's ongoing communication with Taliban near the airport, that there's a lot less visibility the farther you go out into the city, and that's possibly where you know, there might be threats of kidnapping, or there might, is that what really we're trying to avoid here? There, there's a lot. There's a whole panoply of security concerns that we have. Uh, uh, and again, to my answer to Courtney, this is a non-combatant evacuation. That's what we're focused on. And so the idea, as the general uh, very clearly indicated in his opening statement, is to get as many people uh, out as we can, as fast as we can. Uh, and so that's what the focus is. And uh, clearly. In being able, er, in trying to accomplish that mission, uh, we're, we're, we're taking in a whole wealth of information about what the security environment looks like. We, but, but our presence is there at the airport. The mission is there at the airport, uh, and that's and that's the key focus. Is there a sense, though, that the window of opportunity here is closing, and closing maybe possibly quickly as the security situation on the ground? It I, I think we've been very honest about the fact that uh, that we know we're uh, that we're fighting against both time and space. That's really what we're, that's what we're, what, what we're uh, uh, that's the race that we're in right now. And, um, and uh, we're, we're trying to do this as quickly and as, as safely as possible. Um, I'm not going to speculate about whether windows are closing or opening. Uh, uh, we're focused on accomplishing this mission as fast as we can. Yeah, Lucas. John, two days before Kabul fell, you said from that podium, quote, the city is not right now in any imminent threat environment. How could you get that so wrong? In the moment that I said it, Lucas, uh, it was true. Um, and I understand. I've, I've, I've seen the reactions out there on social media to what I said. With Taliban. In the moment that I said it, based on what we knew at the time, uh, it was a true statement. And yes, two days later, things dramatically changed. I readily admit that. Uh, things moved very, very quickly, Lucas. Uh, and, and as you heard the chairman up here just uh, a few days ago say that, you know, that there, was, there wasn't any indication that, you know, that, uh, that, that, that they had received, uh, that things could evolve as quickly as, as they did. But no indication. Cities have been falling Lucas, all week, every day. Yes, I understand, no. Lucas. I understand. I understand. All I can tell you is, uh, in the moment that I made those remarks, they were accurate. I'm committed 100% to being as truthful and as honest up here and as transparent as I can be. Um, and I'm comfortable uh, that while others may ridicule what I say and, and, and take issue with it, I'm comfortable that what I'm giving you is the best information I have the moment that I have it. And I would hope and understand that people would see that events have did and have continued to evolve very, very quickly there. To Courtney's excellent line of questioning, the, the assessment, uh, the threat is going to change, and it could change literally by the hour. So we're, we're trying to give you as, the best we can as, and lean as far forward as we can in the moment, but that moment's going to change. Friday, but it could be changing by the hour. You said there was no imminent threat of Kabul falling. That's, I, I, again, I think I've answered the question. So yes. 10 years ago, then General Lloyd Austin, as head of U.S. forces in Iraq, recommended to the president not to pull troops out of Iraq. Months ago, now Defense Secretary Austin recommended the same thing in Afghanistan. Is he frustrated that presidents are ignoring him? The secretary is 100% focused on the mission at hand right now, which is a non-combatant evacuation operation. Uh, and he's comfortable that throughout this deliberation, his voice was heard, that he had 
uh, an opportunity to provide his best advice and counsel to the commander in chief and to the national security team, as did other leaders here at the Pentagon. It was a very inclusive, very deliberate process. Uh, and the secretary believes that the president was, was given the benefit of a lot of different views, not just his, but a lot of different views. And then the commander in chief made a decision. That's how it works. It, it, that, that's exactly how the process should work. A very calm and deliberate decision making process. Uh, and, and once that decision is made, um, you execute. That's, that's the way this building operates. You execute, and that's what we're doing. Is the secretary frustrated that now, not once, but twice, his advice has been ignored by the, the president? The secretary is focused on the mission at hand and not revisiting past decisions one way or another. You give your advice, and a decision is made, and you follow that decision. An order is given, you follow that order, and that's what we're doing. And, and as you heard the secretary say, just after the president announced his decision in mid-April, that he fully supports that decision. He's been very clear about that. Has the secretary thought about resigning? No. One factual question. How many of those 17,000 are American citizens? And have there been any further outside the uh, wire operations by the U.S. military? I do not have a breakdown of, uh, of how many of the 17,000 are Americans. Uh, and there, uh, to my knowledge, since you and I last talked yesterday, there have been no uh, additional operations, as you put it, outside the wire, outside the, the security perimeter of the airport. But look, um, without be getting predictive here, um, we have troops in a, in a very, uh, as I said, dynamic environment, very perilous mission, uh, and they understand that. Um, and they also understand uh, why they're there, which is to, which is to help people. Um, and if I'm not going to rule out the, the possibility that if they see a moment, if they see an opportunity uh, to do it, that they won't do it. What is the, uh, the sensitivity of going outside the, the perimeter? The, uh, the Brits don't seem to have any problem with uh, acknowledging it, and they seem to be doing it uh, pretty openly. I saw a British soldier uh, quoted as saying they were conducting joint patrols with the Taliban. Is there, some, is there something restraining U.S. forces from going out and getting people? You want to take it? Yeah. Do you want me to clarify the numbers? Um, just going back to, I think, your first question, uh, you talked to, I th just can you give me the question again that you yeah. asked? Uh, Question 17, yeah, how many of the 17,000 okay. American I, I, citizens? I think I can help with that, John, on the, the numbers of the American citizens. Is that what you were asking? Yeah. Okay. Total number of American citizens. Yeah, that's approximately 2,500 2, is 25. what it was okay. reported. Yes. Um, when you talk about uh, the, the operations, uh, I'm not familiar with, you know, remember, the, as we look at the joint and coalition of what's uh, operating on HKIA, uh, those British forces at the gate are part of the entire uh, H Kai or the Kabul, you know, security zone. So those uh, patrols you're talking about, I don't have uh, knowledge of people going out uh, side the wire as you speak of patrols. What we do see, both the British Marines uh, that are on those gates are conducting what we'd call those local uh, security operations to continue uh, the best they can to uh, make sure they're safe that uh, all of those, uh, you know, the large crowds that are there are trying to continue to ensure there's, um, you know, control, uh, to allow the people that are uh, allowed to and have the right documents uh, to come into the gates. Local security operations in or outside? The no, I'm talking in at the gates. In at the, at gate. the gates. And are, are uh, British and other forces there under the operational command of uh, the U.S. commanders at the so airfield? So those, uh, those British forces that are there um, at the gates are part of the U.S. for a for the operational uh, control of the commander that has uh, Kabul airport. So he has operational control yeah. of the British forces. And the right? Yes, he's the, he's the commander. Good. Yeah, here. General Taylor, can you, you talked about how 
uh, the local commanders are now metering people coming in at these gates. Does that suggest that the flow is continuing? Absolutely. Uh, in, into that? Into yes. That, and, and thus, if you are an American citizen in Kabul or somewhere else in Afghanistan and can get to the airport, you should try and get to one of these entrances? Uh, what I would say is that as the American citizens come into the gates, uh, we are continuing uh, to process them and get them to safety. I mean, that's our mission. Right. And, and are, have any of these gates been actually completely closed in the last 24 hours? Yeah. 12, 12. Let's make sure, you know, when you look at the gates and, and those, uh, you know, uh, we're ensuring the gates are always have the ability to be open and process the right people uh, that come to the gates. Uh, so that's, I think, uh, very important to understand is uh, the gates are always um, manned by forces there. Uh, that can uh, process uh, the right people that come to those gates uh, all the time. So I'm still, con I'm still confused here. You've got an, a U.S. embassy that's sending out an alert telling American citizens in Kabul, do not come to the gate if you want to get out of here because the si security situation, as John has described, is too, is too threatening. And yet you're saying you should come to the I gate. I did not say you should come. What I said was that uh, there... Yeah. Our military forces at the gate uh, have the ability to continue to process those that come to the gate. How many gates are there? There's, there's, there's multiple gates right now as we, uh, as we look at, there's, you know, three, four main gates that uh, we're processing uh, evacuates through. Reported overnight that two were opened, is that correct? Uh, two additional gates. Okay. When you say two... Two additional gates? Yep. I, I don't have that report of two additional gates. Okay. Let me get to the phone a little bit more. Uh, Idris. Hey, John. Thanks. Uh, so just wanted to confirm, over the past 12, I guess, 24 hours, how many gates have been closed um, and have they been for long periods of time or, or, or short? Uh, just uh, go back. Uh, those gates are open and closed as uh, uh, as required. There's been short durations uh, throughout the uh, the last 24 where gates have been closed uh, to allow uh, the proper people to come in and out of those gates. Okay. Uh, let's see. I need to forget. Uh, Kelly. From uh, next door. Okay. Any more in the room, Louis? Um, can I go back to the 2,500 American estimate? Um, that's a, a very small portion of the 15,000 that the president has said may be maybe the top number of Americans inside. Um, are you making efforts? to try to bring more Americans in. I know you're, tell, you're cautioning them to be aware of the threat environment at the gates. Uh, but at the same time, how do you get all those um, and that many Americans into uh, the airport if there really are that many Americans in the country? Well, I think you've, you've heard us say before we don't have a perfect figure uh, of how many are in Afghanistan, let alone Kabul. Uh, and as the general said, uh, if, if you're an American, um, and you're at a gate, you will be let in that gate. <clears throat> the State Department's doing the best job they can to advise uh, Americans who still haven't made it to the airport what the situation looks like uh, around the airport, and that would be the prudent thing to do. Uh, and as you also uh, heard uh, the President make clear yesterday, that we're going to continue to explore options uh, uh, to assist Americans as needed. Uh, and we will do that. We will do that here at the Pentagon if there's, if there's a need, if there's a need uh, to do something different than what we are already doing to facilitate them uh, getting into uh, the airport, then we'll, we'll certainly consider those options. Is there a separate advisory that goes out to Afghan nationals who have the visas in hand? I mean, are they too being told the moment you know, the, the, the threat dynamic is dynamic? I mean, the threat situation is dynamic right now. Yeah. Be aware. I mean, are they getting uh, similar messages? I, I, I would have to refer you to the State Department. My understanding is that there is a, uh, th that there's, 
ways to communicate to that population, but how that's done, uh, that, that's, that's not a DOD equity. I wouldn't be able to speak to that with any great clarity, Tara. Um, since the mission with the three Chinooks that rescued the 169 uh, Americans, have there been any other airlift rescue operations? And is, the, is that maybe a way that uh, other Americans who are still stranded might be able to get to the airport? No, and I won't speculate about potential future operations going Thank forward. You, Taylor, question for you. Um, you. You talked about the uh, throughput and increasing the throughput yes. of Afghans. Can you talk about uh, the different bases that are opening up and how is that sorting done? How did uh, three aircraft go straight to Dulles and then go straight to Bliss and then some go to Germany? How, is, how are those decisions being yeah. made? So as flights are manifested, meaning a, the roster that's put together at HKI of who's on those aircraft, then a decision's made of where that uh, you know could go to. Uh, let's say you know some flights were going into Qatar to take first to there so that uh, Afghans could then be held there, you know, temporarily, and then waiting for other flights uh, to go. So what we're trying to do is keep the airflow that's in the theater, right, uh, from having to go far, uh, that continue to drop people off to allow other flights uh, to take from, uh, from Qatar forward uh, to, for instance, into Dulles. So, you know, we, it depends on how many folks we have, uh, what it, is it a full flight of SIV? Uh, is it other Afghans? Is it, you know, Americans? So th that is just extremely dynamic. Uh, and, uh, you know, with Transcom and the commanders, as those manifests are done, they make those decisions, you know, on the spot. So is the idea that only SIVs have been fully processed are going to be coming into the U.S. for now? Or will there be a situation where any of the Afghans that are evacuated will be brought onto bases and then work through the system once they're here. So what's very important that we will continue to do is it, the full screening and vetting process uh, that takes place from the beginning uh, all the way to making a final decision of where somebody goes. Uh, I know we will continue that. And then going back to uh, right now, the, the guidance is and will continue is uh, to continue uh, to increase our, our outflows uh, to make that happen. General? Yes. Is the American flag flying at the airport in Kabul right now? Yes. There's some talk from veterans, people who have served in Afghanistan, that the U.S. Embassy, which cost over nearly $800 million to build, why was that closed and the flag taken to the airport? Shouldn't the flag come down last from an embassy when conducting an evacuation? Hey, I can't. Uh speak for the decisions the embassy makes uh, and what they've done. I know that embassy operations and consular operations continue on Kabul airport. And as you know, uh, at the military headquarters, uh, where U.S. personnel uh, are continuing to uh, execute the mission, uh, the flag flies. When evacuating a country, doesn't the American flag come down from the embassy last? That's what a lot of veterans are saying. Yeah. I just, yeah. I would say, yeah. No, I was just going to say is uh, the flag, the flag uh, continues to, to fly and the mission continues right now. Okay, just a couple more. Uh, Courtney. One for each of you. Um, John, the uh, um, Congressman McCarthy put out a statement last night saying that uh, within moments of President Biden saying that we have succeeded in Afghanistan, the Secretary Austin and General Milley provided a bleak assessment of the situation on the ground and, and that he's saying that Secretary Austin specifically acknowledge that Americans were being beaten on their way to the airport. Can you give us any more detail about what, um, who these Americans are that Secretary Austin was talking about? Courtney, we've actually been talking about this for several days here, uh, here at this particular podium. We, we, we know of cases, uh, a small number that we know of. And we don't have perfect visibility, but we know of a small number of cases where some Americans, uh, and, uh, and certainly as the Secretary also said in that statement, Afghans, Afghans that we want to evacuate, not, it wasn't just Americans that he talked about, um, have been harassed and in some cases beaten. Uh, we don't believe it is a very large number. Uh, and in a matter of fact, the, uh, the numbers would indicate, and I've said this before, that, uh, that most uh, by and large, most Americans who, uh, who have their credentials with them are being 
uh, allowed through the Taliban checkpoints and and onto uh, and onto the gate and onto the into the gate and onto the airfield. So by and large, um, most Americans are having no problems that we're aware of. Now, I, I have to caveat it, and I'll do it again, and I've, I've done it every day. We are aware of sporadic cases that where they aren't being allowed, where there is some harassment going on, and yes, some physical uh, violence has occurred. And um, as the secretary has made clear, and he made clear it in that phone call, that's unacceptable. And Admiral, Admiral Vasily has made that clear to uh, the, the Taliban uh, commanders that he's talking to, that it's unacceptable. But what I'm wondering is the, 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 the cases that the, the secretary was talking to the members about, did, were those occurring yesterday? I mean, are these recent? Or are we talking about cases that were Over literally? the course of the last week, we have become, we, we have been made aware of this. I mean, more cases since the U.S. started talking to the Taliban and telling them not to do I it? I don't have an exact breakdown day by day, uh, Courtney. I mean, we've been in touch with the Taliban for quite some time. I think uh, over the course of the last week, um, and we've certainly made our concerns known. Uh, and I think equally frustrating uh, is the fact that, that not it, it, what appears to be happening is that not every Taliban fighter either got the word or decided to obey the word. Uh, and I can't speak to Taliban command and control, uh, but, uh, but by and large, and for the most part, uh, Americans with their credentials are, are being uh, given the passage they need through the checkpoints and are, are getting onto the field, again, security conditions permitting. And just one for you, more for you, General Taylor. Yep. There's been, there were some reports overnight on social media, including some pictures showing empty C-17s flying out, some people, passengers saying that they were virtually empty when they were leaving. Is that the case? I mean, do you have any sense of are some aircraft leaving Kabul airport relatively empty without evacuees, and if so, why? Yeah. First, uh, you know, that flight cycle continues, you know, and what the commanders on the ground know is to continue to evacuate and ensure uh, everybody gets out as fast as possible. What we don't know is maybe on that situation, what I'm not aware of that exact flight might have had a different mission to do something else. So I can't answer that. But what I do know, as you've seen in our throughput, is uh, we are getting those that are ready to fly, that have been fully screened, uh, ready to fly on aircraft uh, and moving to uh, onward destinations. But the 3,800 that you mentioned in your opening statement, that in is those are including the 32 charters that went out and other that's correct. Do we, do we know how many of the six mil U.S. military C-17s, do we know how many people were on those? By any Approximately 1,600. Thank you. Okay, okay. last one. Eric, uh, Lucas, let, let Eric have a follow-up. Oh, of course, Eric. General, General the 17,000 have been evacuated. Do you know roughly how many have gone to that initial way stop, whether it's Qatar or now, as we learned yesterday, uh, the UAE and Bahrain also took some of those initial flights? And is the Qatar facility essentially full up at this point? You're going to have to permanently transition to some of these other intermediate way stations? Uh, no. So, uh, as you remember, as we talked about the number uh, that continue to move, um, I, I just want to talk about Qatar, you know, uh, specifically. There was time period yesterday where uh, we delayed flights going in there to allow other flights to leave to ensure that the current capacity uh, that Qatar, which was really uh, well done there to continue to build that capacity so fast um, to allow those flights to depart before we bring flights in. And now that uh, we have Ramstein open also, like I mentioned earlier, that will allow us to, uh, today in the next uh, 24 uh, is the plan to assess to get back into numbers that we saw the day before uh, and moving them out. Okay, thanks, everybody. Quick one. We, we have to get as going. As the terrorist Lucas. threat against the United States increased since the Taliban took over going. the country. Are you breaking the mind? Your reaction to what you just heard at the Pentagon. I, I want to start off by saying uh, that this was not an intelligence failure. I want to protect those individuals in the intelligence community who made clear warnings. Uh, the picture now that we're seeing is that in May and June, there were intel, intelligence officials as well as State Department career officials saying that the situation was dire, that it was getting worse, that the Taliban was on the march. Those warnings through May and June were ignored. On July 1st, uh, it, so much was ignored that we closed Bagram Air Base. Um, that 
obviously was a disaster. The 5,000 NATO troops at that point said, if you're closing the Bagram Air Base and Americans are leaving, we had 2,500 Americans at that point and 5,000 NATO troops. NATO troops just said, we're out of here as well. So mm -hmm. we saw chaos throughout uh, July. On July 13th, State Department officials at Embassy Kabul said, uh, this is untenable. We, we put forward a, a uh, what we call a dissent cable at the State Department. I've spent 10 years at the State Department, and I know right. many of these people, and 22 of the 23 individuals who work at Embassy Kabul in the economic and political section signed the dissent cable and said that the chaos is ensuing. Nothing was done after that. Um, yeah. And so I want to be clear this was not an intelligence failure. This was a failure of the political class in Washington, D.C. Ambassador, we've heard the assessments from the president, sort of unicorns and rainbows, last month. We know now there was a tremendous amount of dissent, both at state, uh, within the intel community, and at the Pentagon on this. But yet, for over a month, the White House said, this is, this is great. We're, we're, this is exactly what we should be doing. We are fully prepared. We've made every contingency. Do you believe that the president has been lying to the American people about this all along? Look, we just saw at the Pentagon press conference today, John Kirby saying that some Americans were attacked, but it wasn't widespread. Now, now take that. that. That happened today. That just happened. Take that with what Joe Biden just said in his uh, speech, where he tried to update us on Afghanistan. And, and he said, if one American is attacked, and then he went further and he said, actually, if they're harassed or blocked, trying to get to the airport, there would be severe consequences. Mm -hmm. He said that if you blocked Americans, you harassed right. them from getting to the checkpoint, there would be severe consequences, let alone attacks on Americans. And now we've got the Pentagon spokesman literally dismissing attacks on Americans because it wasn't widespread. That, yeah. was, that was his analysis. This is outrageous. This is, uh, imagine what the Taliban is hearing. Imagine what Taiwan is hearing. Imagine what Israel is hearing. Sure. Imagine what Iran is hearing. We, we've got a big concern. And mm -hmm. I, I got to say to people who are watching us, you got to get involved. This is a moment. You know, every great civilization has lasted roughly 250 years. I'm not a negative person. But if yeah. you don't get involved in your country right now, you're going to lose your country. Ronald Reagan told us every generation has to fight for freedom. Yeah. This is your time to stand up and be counted. I'm tired of the, I'm afraid of the cancel culture. you got a country to save. Speak out. A Ambassador, you mentioned NATO earlier. The Wall Street Journal published another withering opinion piece about how Biden has, how, how Biden has handled this, has done long-term damage to NATO and the confidence of our allies in U.S. leadership. Uh, Europe may be facing now renewed threats from Islamic terrorism and a, and a refugee crisis. What are you hearing? You were stationed there. What were you, what are you hearing out of your contacts in Europe? Look, I don't say this lightly. Um, I have spoken to a head of state from a NATO country, and the reality is, is they're very frustrated that NATO is not being mobilized. NATO needs U.S. leadership. And what could happen right now is uh, U.S. leaders at NATO could gather everybody together and say, we are going to start taking everybody out that's at risk in Afghanistan. We may land in your country. Uh, it needs to happen immediately. We will then go through and assess through a serious process who could come to the United States and who can go to other countries, but right. we need to get them out and, and have safe haven. That's not happening. There is no U.S. leadership. And look, I don't buy what John Kirby said, that you know they're sharing their uh, information uh, with President Biden. Secretary Austin has a responsibility. He's been hearing from people on the ground. He's been hearing from NATO allies. He's got to speak up much more forcefully, because right now he looks incredibly political, and he looks silent, and he looks like he's just rubber stamping what Joe Biden said. 
Ambassador, there are a dozen terrorist organizations plus that still operate in that region. China and Russia are looking certainly to capitalize on this chaos as well. I'd like you to put your, your, your DNI hat on for a moment here and take our audience through the potential ripple effect of all of this. Well, it's a good question, uh, and I'm sure you'll understand that I, I can't do much of that. Um, we, we clearly have great partners in the region. Uh, a lot of people are concerned about the rise of China. China will absolutely take advantage of this situation. They already are. I'm hearing reports that the Chinese are, are immediately rushing in to help get Americans to the airport, and then they're telling those stories so that they look like the heroes. This is what the Chinese do. Mm -hmm. um, and we have to be on guard that we are in a, a fight. Um, I have to say that these rumors that um, the Biden administration uh, is talking about who is going to be our U.S. ambassador to China, um, I'm very concerned about the names that are floating because mm. we've got uh, people who need to stand up against China and the videos coming out um, are, are really showing these individuals who are being considered as apologists for China. Mm. And right now, that's not what we need. Uh, one of the other revelations, Ambassador, this week was that uh, President Biden apparently approached Russia about the prospect of the U.S. leaving Afghanistan, but then keeping troops and resources, military assets in other Central Asian countries. Putin obviously said no. Uh, I'd like to get your reaction to learning that he actually did that, and, and do you believe that that was a naive strategy? Well, I'm concerned that we're asking for permission. Um, you know, the, this is an administration that really believes in consensus first. And, and consensus sounds good, right? It sounds like, oh, can't we all just get along and let's find common ground. And I, I think that that's really good for school board uh, debates. <laughs> but it's not good for foreign policy. Um, and, and I believe that strongly. You can be very nice and strong in diplomacy, and you can have allies, and, and you can make the arguments of why your position is good for our allies. But to somehow just you know allow other countries to veto what we believe our foreign policy, uh, what, what's best for our foreign policy, is unacceptable. Mm -hmm. And this is an administration that constantly pushes consensus. And what that means to me is Europeans, Eastern Europeans, Russia possibly, gets to decide whether or not our policy goes forward. They're approving our policy. They're able to veto our policy. Look no further than Nord Stream 2. Right. Uh, and, you know, Joe Biden always is saying, well, this is what the Germans wanted. And pipeline was going to be built. Well, it's not what the Europeans wanted. Yeah. So I think that America first means we put forward what's best for us. We articulate that. We have ambassadors that push that message. And we remind our allies that when America is strong, the rest of the world is strong. So what's, what is good U.S. foreign mm -hmm. policy is actually good global policy. All right, Ambassador Rick Rennell. Unfortunately, I have to leave it there, but we really appreciate your insights. Thank you. Thanks for having me.